Hey, what's up guys? Joker here and I hope you're all doing well. Today we are finally going to be getting a look at Intel's 10th generation CPUs with the i9-10900K as well as the i5 10600K, we're going to be taking them through their paces in gaming as well as CPU productivity benchmarks. And I'm going to be benchmarking them up against a couple of Ryzen counterparts in the form of the Ryzen 9 3900X as well as the Ryzen 5 3600X, which match up quite comparatively in terms of their pricing and availability from AMD. So those are the matchups we're gonna be looking at here today. We're gonna to be doing gaming benchmarks as well as some CPU benchmarks for productivity and things of the like. Now, I don't want to waste too much of your guys' time before getting into the benchmarks, but I do want to talk about things like the test setup. I mean, you guys all pretty much know the specs on these different processors. The 10900K is a 10-core, 10 20-threaded CPU. We've got a 6-core, 12-thread with the i5-10600K. The Ryzen 9 3900X is a 12-core, 24-thread, which obviously has more cores than Intel, so you would expect it to do better in multi-threaded workloads. But Intel has typically been faster in terms of single core as well as gaming performance. So we're gonna see if that holds up true here today in this video. Of course, if you want links to where you could pick up any of the parts we're gonna be talking about in this video, I will leave links down in the description below over to Amazon, which does help to support my channel. As far as my test setup is concerned, I tried to keep everything as even as possible. So both of these were done inside of closed systems with as close as possible motherboards that I could utilize. So along with my samples from Intel, they sent me the Gigabyte Aorus X490 master board, which works with these processors. And thankfully I also had an AMD X570 70 board, which was a gigabyte Aorus Master. So I used Aorus Master motherboards for both of the different test systems, although obviously I can't use the same one. I had to use X570 for AMD and X4 or Z490. I don't know. I'm, I'm getting so confused with these numbers and these letters. Z490. I had to turn around and check the box for a second. Z490 for Intel, X570 um, for AMD. So their latest motherboard platforms were utilized um, for this. I was using a Fractal Design S36, which is a 360 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler for both of the systems. And I use the same exact 16 gigabyte kit of G-Skill Trident Z memory, which works at 3200 megahertz on the XMP profile. And for my GPU, I was just running an RTX 2080 Ti Founders Edition card, everything at stock settings on the GPU as well as the CPU. And I was using XMP, as I said, uh, for the memory so we can get the benefit of that 3200 megahertz on that. So with the test setup out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at the gaming benchmarks as well as the CPU benchmarks. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, things like temperatures later on in the video if you want to stick around for that stuff. But I feel like a lot of you are probably mostly interested in seeing how these CPUs actually match up uh, in terms of the scores. But we will get into all of the nitty gritty towards the end of the video. So we'll start off with the gaming benchmarks and being that these are CPU benchmarks, we try to avoid being GPU bound as much as possible. So that's why we use something like a 2080 Ti and I'm actually testing at 1080p on ultra settings. So I didn't bother with 1440 or 4K because the tests are obviously going to scale and the numbers are going to e get even closer as you move up in resolution and become even more and more GPU bound. So we're focusing here strictly on, you know, trying to remove that GPU as a variance here. So that's why we test at 1080p on the ultra preset. And as you can see here, for the vast majority of the titles that I did test, the 10900K is far and above the winner against even, you know, the 10600K and, of course, the AMD CPUs. And I really feel, feel like this is not going to be that much of a surprise to most of you out there that, you know, Intel, you know, being faster in single core performance is going to dominate when it does come uh, to gaming benchmarks. However, you know, some of these games are actually really close. Uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Far Cry New Dawn, though, did seem to really um, favor the extra clock speed and the cores of the 10900K, even though something like the 3900X has a couple of additional cores, you know, it's it's a little bit slower in terms of its clock, so it's not going to um, be as fast as the 10900K. So in something like that, it really does show its strength for the Intel side. Uh, but then some other games like F1 2019, I mean, it's really, um, you know, pretty much neck and neck here across all the different CPUs, even something like a 3600X, which you can find for around uh, 200 to $250. Even that's coming in at 175 average FPS versus the 191, 
of the 10900K, so not a huge variance there. And if you were to bump that up to 1440p or 4K, those numbers are likely going to get even closer. Oddly enough, Strange Brigade really preferred the i5 10600K, although all the numbers here are within 10 frames per second of variance or less, actually. Um, so really nothing huge in terms of frame rate difference there. Um, but really, I think the end of, at the end of the day here, the story is that um, in terms of just raw gaming performance, if you want the absolute most possible out of your GPU, then Intel is probably going to be... Um, the way to go, but it's not going to benefit you so immensely that you would be missing out um, if you were to grab something like a 3900X, and if you did, you would probably be wanting to take advantage of the multi-threaded workload stuff. Uh, anyway, this was the average FPS. Of course, I'll go ahead and show you guys the 1% lows here, where the story is not changing at all, although obviously these numbers are going to be lower than what the average frames per second was. We didn't really see um, any huge differences here where I would say like one CPU is better at maintaining uh, a higher 1% lower or anything like that. Everything is scaled about where we would expect them to pretty much fall. Moving into some of the straight CPU benchmarks, I did run Cinebench R20 in single-threaded as well as multi-threaded, and we can see that in single-threaded, the 10900K is sitting atop of the charts with a score of 536, while the 10600K was actually in second place at 507, and the 3900X was very close behind at 505, and the 3600X was at 497. And these were honestly a lot closer than I thought they would be um, for single-threaded, but of course, when it comes to multi-threaded, which if you're really looking to spend like $500 or on a CPU, you should be concerned about the multi-threaded performance and probably wanting to take advantage of it. And in those particular cases, the 3900X definitely dominates here as it's got the extra cores to compete against the 10900K. And you can actually find these now um, for below $500. So they're even a much better value proposition versus the 10900K getting 7162 versus the 6160 of the 10900K. The 3600X and the 10600K were much more closely matched, although the 3600X actually did run a little bit faster than the 10600K, which I found to be quite surprising here. I guess Cinebench maybe prefers AMD a little bit, even though both of those CPUs had the same cores and thread counts, and the single thread was a little bit faster on Intel. It seemed to actually run a little bit better on AMD, so maybe that's a test that um, maybe favors AMD just ever so slightly. Moving on from that, we've also got the Blender BMW benchmark test. This is a pre-made test for the Blender application where you can render out this image. A lot of people use it. And basically what we're looking at here is how long it takes for the image to render out in seconds. So the lower the score here is the better. So obviously the winner here being more cores, more threads, Blender favors that immensely. The 3900X was the winner at just under two minutes to go ahead and render that out while the i9 10900K was 137 seconds. So a 20 second difference there between those. And then when it came to the 10600K and the 3600X, it did favor Intel, even though same core, same threads. This particular um, application did seem to favor the higher core, uh, frequency of the uh, 10600K when matched up against an equal processor in terms of thread count. And last up, we've got the 3D Mark Time Spy test. This is just specifically the CPU physics test that runs during that benchmark. And as you can see, the 10900K is at the top of the charts here with 13,957 versus the 3900X at 12,307. And then rounding that out, we've got the 10600K at 8313 and the 3600X at 7458. So just in terms of the gaming benchmarks and the CPU benchmarks, my, my main takeaway here is that the people that were interested in something like a 9900K to begin with, even though you could get an 8-core 16-threaded part from AMD for a couple of years now for much cheaper than Intel, I feel like the people that were interested in the 9900K to begin with, the enthusiasts that just want the absolute fastest gaming processor out there, are probably going to be the same exact people that are interested in picking up a 10900K, even though you're gonna get a better value and more cores and more threads and something like the 3900X, which you can find now for around $410, at least at the time of me recording this video, even though it launched at $500, which is closer to Intel's retail price on the 10900K of $490. Um, that's really where I was coming at in terms of testing these up against each other, but you can find the 3900Xs uh, cheaper now. So for someone that wants to take advantage of those extra cores and threads, like you saw in the CPU test there, the 3900X is going to be the better buy as it is currently cheaper 
and it's going to win out when it is coming to doing high stressful workloads like video encoding, rendering out videos and things of the like. So if that's your main focus and you wanna do gaming as a secondary, I would say go AMD all day on a Ryzen 9 CPU, whether it's the 3900X or the 3950X, which I didn't include in this because it's a completely different price point. Those are up around $750. So that's completely next up in terms of the price point. But obviously, if you need those extra cores and threads, that processor is there. It just doesn't really make sense to test that against um, the 10900Ks. It's just going to further spread out um, you know, the victory margins there in terms of multi-threaded workloads. But for strictly just gaming Intel, is still king right now, and it's really going to be for a very specific market that people that want to go for that, even though, you know, the numbers are very, very close, and, you know, chances are you could just go out and grab yourself a 3600X and even run that with a 2080 or a 2080 Ti, and you're going to be absolutely fine at the end of the day, because more than likely, you're not going to be gaming at 1080p, you're very likely going to be gaming at 1440p, or 4K, or ultra-wide, something along those lines, or even like the super ultra-wide monitors, and if you're doing that, those numbers are going to get even closer between AMD and Intel. So it makes more sense to kind of hedge your bets and save money on the CPU and then invest more, more money uh, into your graphics card. But the 10900K is there for enthusiasts that don't care and maybe want to buy a 3080 Ti later this year or maybe even two 3080 Ti's and slap it in a system and make sure that they have the absolute fastest CPU gaming performance out there. Whether or not they can really leverage those extra cores and threads, um, the CPU is there. And, you know, it's I can definitely recommend it for people that are looking at that. But if you're on a budget, um, there's really no reason to entertain spending $500 on a CPU unless you really, really need it or you just really want it and don't care what it's going to cost. So that's my final conclusion based on the benchmarks um, for people that are curious about temperatures uh, and clock speeds and stuff like that. Obviously, I was testing here, as I said at the start of the video, uh, at stock settings, and the 10900K actually did perform uh, better than I had initially thought it would in terms of temperatures. It was running around like seven, around like 70 degrees um, Celsius, but um, you know the the cores the, the cores would actually clock down a little bit. So I feel so if you were to put on something like multi-core enhancement, like on my motherboard um, with the uh, Z490 AORUS Master at least, it would run around 4.9 gigahertz on all cores. But I've heard some people say their motherboards are running at 4.8, others were running at even five gigahertz. So it kind of depends on the motherboard vendor that you happen to be using. And if you're using something like multi-core enhancement, or if you're going to get in there and manually tweak it, which I feel like is going to be the best case scenario at the end of the day is getting in there on the 10900K and really manually tweaking the voltages and the cores to get, you know, the same core uh, clocks on every single core in there, all 10 cores, all 20 threads running it like say five gigahertz and then mess around with the voltages and try to get the most out of it for what you can because with something like multi-core enhancement enabled, when it's running at 4.9 gigahertz, the, te the temperatures can definitely get into the high 80s, which as I said, is better than I expected. And we have to really credit that um, to Intel who, you know, even though they are cramming an extra two cores into these processors, they've done a lot at the engineering level in terms of having um, a thinner die as well as a thicker IHS in order to be able to dissipate that heat there, which, you know, doesn't really sound like they did that much, but it actually ended up working to their benefit um, quite a bit. So do you need a 360 millimeter all-in-one cooler in order to be able to run this processor? Not necessarily. You'd probably be fine with a 240 millimeter all-in-one unless you really want to get into overclocking uh, and try to run this thing at like 5.2, 5.3 gigahertz plus on all core. In that case, yes, you're definitely going to want a high-end liquid cooler because you're going to be pumping out over 300 watts of power, no doubt about it. In its stock configuration, it's going to run definitely under 300 watts. It definitely tries to target that lower TDP that's on the box. But if you're getting into overclocking, it's going to definitely uh, push your power output. And as a result, your temperatures are going to be higher as well. But that's all I've got for you guys today here on the brand new Intel processors. If there's anything else you'd like to see me test with these, please let me know down in the comments below as I'd love to do a follow-up video, uh, maybe on that type of overclocking stuff. 
uh, and really get into the kind of nitty and gritty, nitty gritty of it and the stuff I couldn't really fit all into this one video here where I mostly just wanted to focus on the benchmarks and the gaming performance and uh, the CPU tests obviously against the Ryzen processors which is probably what most people are interested in seeing um, but for you enthusiasts out there that want to get into get into the deep dive stuff and you know t really get in there and test um, you know temperatures and and overclocking undervolting stuff like that we can definitely do that in a follow-up video so let me know down below if that's something you are interested in seeing I'm gonna go ahead and get out of here though guys and I hope to see you in the next video Ta -ra.